as you're going to hear in this talk, I think we need much higher levels of civic engagement in this country. And I see this virtual alumni series as an example of the kind of engagement and public education that we need about how our governments function. So I'm going to jump in and share my slides here. And, uh, and I'm going to give a quick roadmap of where we're going in this presentation. Um, but first, I want to just sit with this image that I took in the city of Detroit, which I think embodies the values that I sought in this book and the values that I hope will transmit to you in the course of this presentation. This is a photograph that I took in Detroit of the Heidelberg Project, an art installation in East Detroit, a very, very poor neighborhood. Um, and this was an installation when I uh, took this picture, it was a couple of days after somebody had burned down one of the houses where the artists that are part of the Heidelberg Project had been doing um, some of their works. So there was an arson of one of their buildings. Um, but instead of getting sort of angry or giving up or sort of expressing their frustration on the ashes of the foundation of the building they had just lost to arson, the artists installed what can only be called a stuffed animal dinner party, which I think is so, so embodies the kind of resilience and joy and community and communication that I really want to impress on you is sort of at the heart of some of our hardest problems. Um, I have this picture blown up right on the wall of my office to always remember this kind of spirit and this kind of, of energy. Um, the quick overview of our presentation today is that I'm going to give you a landscape of the central problem that I'm writing about in my research and in this book. And then we're going to talk about four places that are exemplary of some of the work that I think we need. And then I'm going to look back across some of the things I learned in the course of this work. Um, you can think of me like the urban studies department of a law school, which many of you may not realize is a thing, but it's actually, I think, very important component of law to understand how how local governments operate. Um, and this magnificent quote to me is really um, the heart of some of what I love about working on cities, whether it's their environmental challenges or their poverty and inequality ones. Um, this magnificent quote from Christopher Morley that was painted on a bathroom door in Stockton, all cities are mad, but the madness is gallant. All cities are beautiful, but the beauty is grim. Um, and at some level, this project has really had to sit right on the seam between um, some of our hardest problems and some of um, humanity's capacity to solve them. All of that beauty, all of that madness, all of that darkness. The central problem that I work on these days um, is that the United States has become a nation of local government haves and have nots. Um, and this may seem intuitive to some of you, but I want to really bring it to ground with some very local examples. Sorry, Tanya, I know you used to work in Palo Alto and nothing against Palo Alto libraries. I think they're beautiful and special, and I take nothing away from their um, preeminence in the world of public libraries. But I do want to use them as a contrast for what's going on in other places. As you all know well, Palo Alto today is an extremely wealthy community. And uh, in 2008, um, voters in Palo Alto approved a $76 million bond measure, which funded renovations of all of the city's five libraries. And the city, as you may recall, is 67,000 people. Um, Meanwhile, may, as you may or may not also realize, a lot of the workforce for Palo Alto and Silicon Valley lives in Stockton and other cities in the, um, uh, the inner belt of cities um, outside of uh, Silicon Valley. For a worker to reach Palo Alto, they're spending about three hours a day away from their families and their children, depending on how they get here. The traffic patterns are terrible. The public transportation is even worse. But our hospitals, our restaurants, our um, janitorial services, um, and our um, so much of the low wage workforce that really fuels the backbone of Silicon Valley prosperity and Palo Alto's prosperity comes from cities like Stockton. But by contrast to Palo Alto's library, the city of Stockton um, had a series of devastating budget cuts in that same window of time, 2008 
to 2011 that resulted in layoffs of this order across all city departments, but nearly half of the library staff. Um, retraction of main branch hours, all kinds of consequences across the system, including the closure of the Fair Oaks Library, which you see pictured here on the slide. Um, this is a Harry Potter book release at Fair Oaks before the library was shut down. Fair Oaks is an incredibly low income community. Um, Stockton is a very racially segregated city and um, and uh, Fair Oaks was in a very poor and um, uh, formerly de jure segregated part of town. And this is what Fair Oaks looked like once it had been closed. In fact, this photo is not really representative because um, Fair Oaks parking lot became a sort of tent encampment across um, some of the hardest years of the um, uh, recession and beyond. Um, Fair Oaks, I should say one other thing, remained closed until 2017 um, because these larger cuts um, really embedded in the larger budgeting process and, um, and kept it closed. Um, Stockton, uh, by contrast to Palo Alto, is 322,000 people, um, uh, orders of magnitude bigger, and yet with a budget that is only $2 million more than the city of Palo Alto's today. Um, this matters a lot because um, we can we can have an argument about the virtues and values of libraries. And in fact, my colleague at NYU, Eric Klinenberg, has just written a terrific book on how libraries are important in all social classes. So this takes nothing away from the importance of libraries in Palo Alto. But I think that also coexists with the reality that in a city like Stockton, libraries are the access points for things that people cannot buy privately. All of these books behind me that I am prosperous enough to own privately, children who have private libraries in their homes, children who come to kindergarten um, ready to learn to read, um, and uh, access to home computer equipment, access to home Wi-Fi, all kinds of things that in a city like Palo Alto people can buy privately are out of reach in a city with the poverty levels in Stockton. And that uh, at some level, you know, uh, captured by these two data points for you to picture this difference um, that in Palo Alto, nearly 80% of the elementary school kids in the district are testing at the um, at or above the proficiency level for reading. Whereas Stockton is nationally known as in the midst of what can only be called a literacy crisis, in which the number of kids reaching third grade without third grade proficiency in reading, which is a um, terrible marker for not only failure to graduate from high school, but also incarceration and other um, uh, disadvantages and, and tragedies going forward. Um, only 27% of elementary school students in Stockton Unified are reaching this same proficiency goal um, in elementary school. So it's all to say that I think libraries are arguably essential to the core mission of education in the city, in a city with needs like Stockton. Um, but the work that we're going to talk about here, this inequality problem of local government haves and have nots, is not just about libraries. It's also about access to drinking water. It's about access to transportation to reach jobs. It's about um, 911 dispatch services. This headline um, was not only reported um, across the West in our newspapers out here, but in the UK, I found an Indian headline, a headline from India reporting this same event in which in Josephine County, Oregon, which we're going to talk about, um, there was a violent rape that was reported to 911. And as a part of a long-standing pattern that was going on across a period of years. 911 had no um, had no sheriffs available for dispatch. And we got this larger kind of story of 911 having its hands empty, unable to dispatch emergency services, whether fire or police or um, medics um, in Detroit and many other cities uh, that were going through this kind of terrible collapse in their local government services. Um, and we started to develop 
patterns of um, uh, structuring and funding public services in poor neighborhoods that were different too. And this is a New Yorker cartoon um, kind of making fun of this larger idea of subscription-based fire services. Um, but this is not a flight of fancy. There are subscription-based fire services in many very low-income rural areas around the country, even those on the, you know, surrounded by wildfire zones. There's a tremendous amount of privatization and private equity um, uh, investment in, um, in fire protection and in privatized fire protection. And so we're starting to see the legal and political structures of these kinds of basic services changing as well in ways that make them more like a an a la carte amenity that we buy out of pocket and less like a necessary public service for basic collective safety. So behind these kinds of changes is what I call the border to border poverty problem or the citywide poverty problem, which is that when you have really high levels of concentrated poverty in a city or county, and you have a depressed median income across town, your whole tax base weakens. Um, and I want to just drill down into what concentrated poverty means so folks can really, um, you know, picture how severe this is. So this is a term of art from social science that describes 20% of people living under the federal poverty line, which is about $26,000 a year for a family of four. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I really encourage you tonight to get out a pen and a piece of paper and try and imagine a family budget on $26,000 for a family of four. If you live in California, you literally will not be able to get your head around how to do that. And yet in our state, using that poverty line, we have 12 to 15% under the poverty line in any given year. So we have immense concentrated poverty in this state. Um, even in lower cost jurisdictions, 26000 for a family of four is devastating. And if you've got one in five of your residents living below that line, then chances are you have a lot of residents sitting pretty close to it, maybe beating the poverty line, but, um, but sitting close to it. And that metric, this sort of overall phenomenon of a depressed income base all across town, is captured by the low median income, which in the book I measure as two thirds of, of um, uh, the statewide median income. Again, just a metric from social science. Um, so we get this kind of border to border poverty that depresses the, um, the overall tax base. And once that happens, you start to see this pattern, which is that the fact that there's so much poverty in this jurisdiction starts to work in this kind of cyclical dynamic with the fact that the local government becomes broke. And these two things start to be self-reinforcing, um, that you uh, that the um, local governments are broke in part because there's so much poverty and their people stay poor in part because their governments are broke. Um, and the basic reasoning for this is this idea that revenues you know, go down, whether it's income taxes, sales taxes, property values that are the basis of property taxes. Um, as need goes up, um, people are more reliant, for instance, on public transportation and other things that in the city of Palo Alto, many residents, um, but for age, um, can uh, afford private transportation of various kinds. Um, you also have fewer local resources to help people get out of poverty. And I think as these two things sort of work together over decades, because the kind of poverty I'm talking about has been building for 40 years at least, you get this ongoing um, acceleration toward what we think of as poverty traps. And I think this idea that it's very hard to get out of these places and get into better opportunity structures. For the lawyers in the room, I just want to highlight, this is a quick aside, um, but I think really interesting and important and where some of this um, research during the Great Recession started for me, um, that there's a legal problem here when a local government officially goes broke, so it goes through municipal bankruptcy or it goes into a state 
program for broke governments, the people in charge, whether it's a bankruptcy judge or a state receiver, have to decide how much funding to hold back for residents as opposed to for budget cuts or for creditors. And so it begs this really deep question. Those of you who loved your political theory classes at Stanford, you can you know, um, wrestle with this amazing question going forward of as judges start to think about sentences like this, additional funding reductions threaten, in this case, Vallejo's ability to provide minimal levels of services to its residents and provide for their basic health and safety. So it really begs this question of what is that? What are minimal levels of basic health and safety? What are we entitled to from our local government? And here too, I wanna, I'm kind of spoiling things by putting this up, I wasn't quite done. Um, I want you to uh, just take a moment to, you know, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, just as basic public education, um, it's so important to realize that legally we are not entitled to any local public services except K-12 education. There is no legal basis for anything, for water, for police, for fire, for libraries, for anything. What gives us those things is politics. It's democracy. It's caring about those kinds of services because whether it's because of we need sanitation because otherwise we have cholera or it's because we need water because otherwise um, there is no ag or no residential development. We invest in those things as a matter of um, collective political democratic choice, but they are not um, provided to us as a, a mandatory feature of our state legal systems. Um, so I want you to kind of engage for a mo as you sort of think on your own in parallel with this talk, I invite you to use the chat to really plug in a few like two to three word answers to this question of what are the most important things that your local governments over the years of your life and the various places you've lived have done to provide for you or your family members basic health and safety. Um, and how and think also about what local governments have done to promote opportunities for people in your families. So really think about as if you were asked, what are the minimum public services that must be provided as a basis for um, democracy beyond K to 12? What are those um, what are those, uh, you know, actions or services by local government? And then separately, I want to invite you to think about how your answer might be different if you lived on 26,000 a year for a family of four. I'm going to assume that most people listening to this presentation don't have that experience, although you may in your family history. Um, and uh, I invite you to really think about what basic health and safety um, uh, you, uh, you know, is most significant from local governments um, under those kinds of circumstances. So plug that into the chat all across the next 10 minutes or so. And at the very end of the presentation, um, I'll uh, enjoy looking at the chat and we can come back to it for a moment. Um, as a public policy matter, and here's the sort of political reality of this situation, um, when we have this dynamic between places that are poor and places that are broke, we have um, some big categorical responses that are often um, thrown around. Um, one is atrophy, which is to kind of the idea that we've naturalized this kind of process and we see it as like a, almost like a life cycle, like you know, there was so much talk, so much talk. Detroit is dying, this kind of eulogizing or, um, or uh, you know, almost um, nostalgic sort of um, talking about cities as though they've sort of come through a peak and they're declining. But of course, internationally, there are cities that are 10,000 years old. There's no natural cycle of life for a city. It is nothing more than a place that people invest in and rely on and build or a place that people abandon. So I think we've been naturalizing cities under this atrophy idea for a long time. 
Number two is that we have um, waited for, hoped for substitution in which volunteers or philanthropy or private actors would take the place of local government over basic needs. Third is suitcases, this idea that the best thing for somebody in Flint is to move to Dallas. The best thing for somebody in Stockton is to get out of Stockton. And yet I wanna remember those numbers that we talked about early on, that Stockton's got 322,000 people and the city of Palo Alto permits something like 80 new housing units a year. So even if you scale that to all of the municipalities in Silicon Valley, we are doing very little shockingly little, I would say unethically little to enable people to move. If we were serious about suitcases, we would need really different land use policy to distribute affordable housing in this country. Detroit's population is not that different than the population of my hometown, San Francisco. It's got a lot of people. So if you're going to solve Detroit's problems by moving everybody, then you're going to have to think seriously about where all those families go. And that says nothing about the fact that once people live at a certain level of poverty, they're ability to move is seriously depressed and depleted. 39% of Americans can't scrounge up $400 in an emergency, let alone the cost of a security deposit in San Jose. And we have this larger um, uh, reality that um, people rely on their family networks to raise chill children and care for elders when they cannot buy those things with cash. So asking people to leave their family networks and move somewhere new in order to, you know, stake out a better life for their kids is a really tough thing in a society that does so little for children and for the elderly. Um, and last but not least, we have this faith in spreadsheets, this kind of idea that if we could just like fix some management, you know, lack of creativity or whatever, um, we would uh, we we could fix these problems and bankruptcies and receiverships do tidy up the spreadsheets. They make important administrative improvements, efficiencies, and so forth. But they cannot deal with the consequences of intergenerational poverty. Chronic poverty is not a spreadsheets problem. It's a much harder, deeper, more durable problem. There's one more that should be on this list. You're going to see it on the next slide. I forgot to add it to this one too, which is regional governments. Um, I can count on these two hands, the number of places in America that have adopted a regional government as a strategy to concentrated um, decline. Uh, it has been rejected by voters in one city after another. And so, you know, there would be advantages to regional governments, but here we are having, you know, lived across decades of that, um, that solution being um, discredited. Without further ado, the whole point of this book is to really think about what reinvestment in these people who live in these places would look like and what kind of change you would need to their governments in order to make that, ref you know, what kind of change you need in order to make that reinvestment work. It's not enough to just hurl money at places. There has to be reform and, you know, networks. In philanthropy, they often call it like, you know, can the money land effectively? Can you actually deliver it into the hands of people who have the trust of the larger community and have the cooperation of other organizations? Um, and so that's really the kind of where this book starts and where a lot of my research began is if we were trying to reinvest, what would that look like? What would we reinvest in and what kind of reform would we need to have it be effective? Um, and, uh, and this book is really just takes that to a very granular level to just look at four places that were very broke, that were in blue or purple states on purpose. I can say something about that in the Q&A if you are interested. But I concentrated just on those states for legal reasons that um, have not tied their local government's hands quite as um, impossibly tight. Um, and uh, and really have sort of invested in local government or believe in local government's ability to solve um, local problems. And I focused on four places. This is a graphic from the Stanford Magazine, this beautiful composite image. Um, and we're gonna see all these places in a minute. Lawrence, Massachusetts, Detroit, Michigan, Stockton, California, and Josephine County, Oregon. And I, um, 
chose these places to really reflect um, the in incredible diversity of places that are um, facing border to border poverty. These places run from politically red to politically blue with some purple activity in the middle. They run from all white to all black to Stockton as the most diverse city in the United States of America. And Lawrence, which has been nicknamed the Latino city, they are rural, they're big city urban, and they are smaller city um, or smaller town. Um, so this is not a problem that we can sort of assign to one kind of causal set around politics or around race or around um, urbanization level. Um, so I wanted to hold that level of diversity. Um, in, and in that way, the reporting on this project and the 250 interviews that went into all of this work was such a magnificent personal experience because these places are so different and yet they assemble to feel like this incredible window into America and into the democratic challenges of governing a place with this kind of range of, of people and problems. So the book begins with, um, with Stockton, um, and we've gotten a little bit of an introduction to Stockton, including its exceptional uh, racial diversity, as I mentioned. Um, I really would encourage you guys to picture what happens to make a city as diverse as Stockton. And it's an incredible um, backstory of, um, of how California was built and the rise of agriculture in the center of the state. Um, Stockton is the confluence of, of the gold rush with intergenerational poverty that is both white and black, black poverty that is coming, that has um, come through the Dust Bowl and um, larger um, displacements and migration out of the American South um, and was subject to some of the most strict forms of racial segregation and discrimination um, that you can see um, in California. Um, but Stockton has also long been an immigrant hub for um, for Filipino immigrants, for Chinese American immigrants, for Japanese American Im immigrants. Its fairgrounds was a point of the internment. And to this day is a hub for um, refugees and immigrants from around the world. So to get this level of racial diversity to you know, beat out every other place in America, um, almost by definition, uh, the backstory of this city is important to understand and fascinating. Um, as an aside, Stockton was also a beacon of religious liberty um, from its earliest days, and that also is part of its kind of character today of just incredible religious diversity. Um, but if you go on Twitter, the only story you'll really hear about Stockton um, is uh, jokes about the gun violence. There's a sort of darkness to how people perceive Stockton um, and the crisis of, of gun violence that has indeed beset the city. Um, I will never forget a joke on Facebook, I think it was, that you know it was not worth it to build a new um, practice stadium for the Kings basketball team um, because you'll just need a bulletproof vest to attend um, events there. And this is the kind of pathologizing that goes on with respect to Stockton's poverty um, all the time. Um, meanwhile, the story that I really focus on there is the way that advocates in Stockton are working together to really treat the traumatic fallout of 40 years of gun violence. When you actually think about what it means to be a peak point of homicides during the crack epidemic and the early 90s, which many cities were hit so hard by homicides then, when you really think about that, you um, really picture the number of kids that witnessed gun violence, that lost families to um, whether it was addiction or homicide or incarceration, just really a generation of the orphaning of Stockton's poorest kids. And there is an a, a exceptional network of people that are working there today to really treat the the causal the cause of gun violence really going to the underlying hyperreactivity and um, trauma that comes from um, uh, from ongoing exposure to violence 
in childhood and um, in adulthood. So it's a healing project, but it is also a violence prevention project that really focuses not just on, you know, everyday residents of the city, but also people returning to Stockton after periods of juvenile or adult incarceration, trying to rebuild um, the family tissue around them. Um, and I love this beautiful photograph from this incredible photography essay that was done at the YMCA in Stockton um, by Whitney Ramirez, a professional photographer. Um, and this was one of many photographs, we'll see one more later in this presentation, in which residents of the city wrote a message on their hands to the city itself. Um, Josephine County is our second stop here, and um, Josephine County is a um, is has most of the poorest census tracts in the state of Oregon. Um, it was a famous hub for controversy around the northern spotted owl, um, and it has had an experiment with the ratcheting down of local government that is exceptionally radical, but actually not that different than what you would find in the retreat of local government in rural Appalachia or the Deep South or other points in the Pacific Northwest or the Rocky Mountain West. And the story that I tell in Josephine is about a citizen movement to substitute for public police and emergency dispatch and run um, public safety as a matter of volunteer um, patrols. And it's also a story of what it means to run a grassroots pro-tax campaign in one of the most anti-government places in the United States. So once you're facing that level of rot in our expectations of government and our belief in government, our faith, how you nonetheless pass um, new measures to support public services. Number three, and I'm gonna start accelerating here because I'm going way too slow. Lawrence, Massachusetts, this magnificent um, mill town on the um, Merrimack River in uh, the um, north uh, eastern corner of Massachusetts, um, a really important um, city to America's early industrial might and um, uh, because of its textile mills, which you can see some of the remaining um, buildings left on the waterfront here. Um, Lawrence, the focus that I work on in Lawrence and that folks there are working on is how you get adult wages up, how local governments and their partners can be part of the urgent need to get adult wages up in the modern economy. And this is a very poetic question in this city because some of you may recognize that Lawrence was the home of the 1912 Bread and Roses strike, which was a giant early labor uprising, one of the most effective in American history. And it managed to get a 15% raise for textile workers across New England. But you can't use those same tactics on Lawrence's people with Lawrence's people now because they work all over the Route 20, 128 corridor. They work as Uber Eats drivers. They work as um, nannies. They work as elder caregivers. They work as um, janitorial staff. They are splintered all over the region with, with employers everywhere. So if you take that same ambition today of how you get a 15% raise for your people, you're going to have to get very creative. And that's what they are doing in Lawrence and Believe it or not, they are pulling it off. Um, and they're doing it through this incredible investment, not only in educational reform, K-12, but also in um, uh, really uh, serving the um, uh, local, the major local employers that are already in town um, and really training the local workforce to um, enter better jobs in um, the public schools, in the hospital, um, and healthcare in general, and um, other um, occupations that have benefits and steady schedules and other um, and pay improvements. Last but not least is Detroit. Um, this image uh, really captures the famous collapse of Detroit's public services 
Um, but, uh, but you know, we shouldn't date that just to the bankruptcy itself. Detroit's public services have been in decline for um, much longer before that. And this incredible um, protest poster um, is a lot to read right now. But the important thing to just see about it is a reminder that even if a place loses lots of population, its total area remains the same. Total square footage of Detroit remains 139 square miles. And as the um, public services have collapsed, you watch the firefighter deaths sort of skyrocket. So they've got fewer fire companies, fewer firefighters, and yet a much more dangerous occupation given the dilapidation of the buildings that these firefighters are um, climbing into and uh, the um, uh, smaller um, uh, dispatch um, groupings. This is a more dangerous job, which is one of many ways that once these places are set on a vicious cycle of layoffs, um, it becomes less and less appetizing to actually work there. But I don't concentrate on fire in the book in Detroit. I concentrate on a different um, part of the um, crisis in Detroit, which is that um, we are now 10 years into a catastrophic foreclosure crisis in the city of Detroit that has turned the city from being a majority homeownership city, one that really is famous, I think, in the American imagination as a hub of working class homeownership and a sort of more modest middle class lifestyle and has um, become a majority tenant city. Um, and, uh, a terrible collapse in Black home, home ownership in particular. And in Detroit, I've really focused on what it means to confront that kind of crisis and stabilize housing. Because the eviction and foreclosure turnover in the city of Detroit is devastating local families' budgets, not to mention the school system, which has to have these kids constantly changing um, locations in ways that um, are, uh, make it very difficult to, um, to serve them. Um, so that was a brief overview of sort of some of the work that has to be done, rebuilding public services, really dealing with the fallout of gun violence, getting adult wages up and stabilizing housing. Those are four big ticket items of what local governments have to do when they face border to border poverty. Um, but I want to just make a to wrap up just a couple of very quick comments about what, you know, big picture, what this kind of governance looks like or sort of the underpinning kind of commitments. And I actually love the message on Stockton City Hall to capture some of the texture of what I would um, aspire to in this kind of work. Um, the City Hall says to inspire a nobler civic life, to fulfill justice, to serve the people. And I wanna just highlight these words to serve the people and really think about what it means for local governments to do that. And even more particularly to serve the people you already have. Because if we have a larger project of the collapse of opportunity and economic mobility at the bottom of our income spectrum in the country, and this is where many of those people live. And so to really face the problem of, of um, dwindling opportunity, um, we've got to go where um, so many of the intergenerationally poor are um, living. But instead, I think too many city halls, their real mantra, if they were to admit to it, has really looked more like this. And this is true for rich city halls, it's true for poor ones attract new residents, right? Like get your averages up, subsidize large businesses. This is, you know, Foxconn, Amazon, HQ2, you know, these sort of signature races to attract um, big employers, defer costs, whether it's pensions or infrastructure, enforce leases by, you know, eviction courts keep running even when uh, the rest of the government has collapsed and arrest people. And there's all kinds of reasons why it's cheaper for local governments to arrest people um, and send the cost to incarcerate them up the chain to the state than it is for them to really invest in those people's educations and their um, quality of life. Um, at, at heart, this is a bathroom message um, from Lawrence. This um, Somebody just wrote this, this bathroom wall that the cafe invited people to write on. 
Um, and I love this beautiful message um, that really captures what resident focused local government looks like. I'm going to not go through this slide in detail, but just to say that at the heart of this work is sewing society back together, sort of rebuilding trust in institutions, helping nonprofits work together instead of just competing with one another for scrapping for dollars from philanthropy and so forth, um, and really to helping uh, local residents um, learn to physically relax on city streets and learn to um, get to know each other again and work together again, um, instead of carrying that sort of tremendous um, cortisol load that comes from violence as they walk through their daily life. Um, and it really is summed up so beautifully by this slide, um, this image from uh, Dan Rivera's um, whiteboard in the Lawrence Mayoral office, which has a little mini conference room in it. And um, this message that he had written to himself, um, I think is so salient for the kind of problems that these local governments face. Lots of things are totally out of their control, but some things are not. And what these governments have in common is that their leaders are showed up to do something and they did it today. They didn't focus just on the problems and the challenges and the people that had abandoned them. They focused on solutions. And at the bottom here, um, Mayor Rivera's wife actually wrote that message, keep your head up, which I also take as deeply symbolic of some of this work, that so much of what we as outsiders do with these cities is stigmatize them, we bash them, we treat them as corrupt backwaters of violence and um, mismanagement instead of really sort of embracing the people that are there and their um, their uh, their ideas about how to make their um, their community better. Um, so, so much of the kind of shift that I saw in these places from vicious cycles of decline to more virtuous cycles of recovery is because people really um, build friendships and relationships and even fun and music and art and so forth so that they can keep their head up in spite of the kind of um, terrible press outside. Um, and this is uh, really the last image I'm going to talk about. One more amazing photograph from the Whitney Ramirez Dear Stockton project. Um, this kind of idea that these kinds of projects take time. They are not ribbon cuttings that you get in a three year um, electoral cycle. They take um, the kind of investment um, that reflects the kind of disinvestment, the decades long disinvestment that these places have struggled with. And I am going to skip all of that and end with this final thank you slide, which is to just sort of um, embody the activist spirit that I hope to sort of um, pass to all of you. This is a, a modification that I often make when I sign the book itself um, to just remember that this whole project is full of people who did that, who fought to save their own town. Most of them don't even work for government. Some of them don't even live there, um, but they picked a place, they picked projects, they invested in, in this work. Um, so I'm so proud to have had the opportunity to write about them and so grateful that, um, that all of you came today. And that's it. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Professor Anderson. I'm gonna jump right into questions from alumni. There's a question from Carolyn. Um, did you work with Stanford alum and former Stockton Mayor Michael Tubbs to see the impact of their universal basic income experiment? Yes, um, so uh, Michael Tubbs, I think was an extraordinary mayor in Stockton. There's a little footnote in the book that says, you might think that um, that I'm biased in favor of Tubbs because he's a Stanford graduate. On the contrary, I actually developed more love for Stanford because Michael Tubbs had graduated from our university. Um, I think he did really good things for the city. And there's a longer story of the kind of larger problems that resulted in his, um, in his electoral loss for his second term. Um, but the UBI experiment that you're asking about um, was a really important uh, experiment. I, um, I'm not going to go into it in depth, except to say that it was privately funded by philanthropy and a very, very small number of participants. And, um, and I, I say that because, unfortunately, I think it was 
very dangerous politically in a purple city like Stockton to run an, a tiny um, experiment like that, um, in which not very many people benefit, but the storytelling about giving out a bunch of free money to, you know, Stockton has a lot of lingo on the streets and in the larger media about you know, what we would call in academia, the undeserving poor, this kind of story that poor people are poor, um, not because of the structures around them, but because they're not working. And Stockton is really has a lot of that um, idea of poverty in town. And unfortunately, the UBI experiment was politically, uh, in my opinion, somewhat toxic for the city's politics. But it is an important thing to be um, working on and thinking about as a matter of higher order public policy. I don't think it should be run by local governments. It should be run by um, state and federal um, or philanthropic entities. Here's a question from Marilyn. Uh, what are characteristics of local governments that have been successful in addressing poverty and equality among residents? For example, do they use similar strategies in governance and do they involve residents in the process? And if so, how do they do that successfully? Yeah, that is so important. I really feel like that's actually at the core of so much of what I was trying to learn about. I wanted to answer that exact question um, because in a really high poverty place, both at the individual level and also among institutions, this kind of scarcity dynamic I was describing where people have negative forms of competition or they're just scared of each other. Or there's a lot of mistrust that accumulates over time. Um, organizing and empowerment and citizen engagement has to really go to the heart of that work. And I'm going to give a quick example from Josephine County, Oregon, in which had so much just general um, uh, mistrust of government, as I mentioned, um, but also had had some specific incidents of mismanagement and um, and uh, what people understood alleged kind of falsehood by a former sheriff. Um, and, uh, and so the current sheriff who was doing so much of this reconstruction work had this incredible effort through these locally based town halls to really face the general public and let them ask questions like, where do you get your money? Do you need more money? Or how old are your police cars? What's the mileage on, you know, did you need that new cruiser? People want answers to these larger um, uh, questions and they wanted to get some things off their chest and this larger um, work that the sheriff and other advocates did there, I think can you know, is properly understood as a form of reconciliation or restorative justice of really trying to rebuild that basic faith in the democracy. Here's a question from Ben. What role does bringing in innovative companies have in revitalizing cities and communities? Doesn't a local economy need to be net positive by earning money from exports in order to grow? Um, so interesting. I mean, I'd be interested to talk online about uh, offline about about that. But, you know, definitely the larger um, imperative of economic development, whether it's jobs or, you know, it's some level that we'd have to debate that sort of, you know, GDP or kind of markers of growth more generally. These are really important metrics for understanding how a city is doing. Um, but I think the problem is that local governments, especially poor ones, climb all over each other to fight for the same few employers and, you know, big, you know, so they can get 100 jobs all at once. Um, but meanwhile, there's all kinds of small businesses that have real needs. And I think part of the economic development work that I'm so interested in is really how you invest in retention of local businesses and expansion of local businesses. That actually keeps dollars local. It helps um, people who are already rooted in the community to remain there and be profitable in town. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, I have at least a bookshelf worth of books behind me that describes and discredits the kind of idea that the Foxconn um, or, you know, Rams new stadium of the world can solve a local government's problems, whether it's competing for football or competing for a big employer. 
you know, only one local government um, wins from those big competitive rounds. And um, by the time they win, they have usually sweetened the deal so much that it actually doesn't pencil for the local government or its people. So we're going to need better answers on the job side. We have a question. Uh, please comment on the state of Mississippi insisting that Jackson pr privatize their water system. Yes, um, that's an amazing question because I have a meeting with advocates coming up to talk about exactly that thing. And I am starting to work on environmental, the sort of environmental side of many of these problems, um, specifically in the South. Um, for now, I want to answer that um, that the city of Stockton actually went through a full scale water system privatization. And it, as it happens, Jackson's privatization proposals have important things to learn from Stockton's experience. Um, that uh, privatization, I'm not unbiased. I was part of the lawsuit to sue over Stockton's privatization um, for environmental water quality reasons, but also because of the long-term risk to ratepayers of that kind of the way the deal was structured. Um, so I'm not unbiased about Stockton's deal, um, but I just have, uh, you know, serious concerns um, and a lot of hard questions to ask about um, about how Jackson would be doing it differently. And for the lawyers in the um, on in our group, and just for those of you who are involved in deal structures of various kinds, you know intuitively that the devil is always in the details. And one of the problems with a place like Jackson right now or any of the kinds of places I work on is that their bargaining position is very weak, especially in the middle of an emergency. And there are, um, and uh, after they've gone through the kind of staff contractions that long-term brokenness requires, um, they really don't have the gilded counsel to defend themselves from bad deals. So some of municipal financial distress is simply caused by signing um, bad deals that are written by outsiders who are pursuing their own financial interests. Here's a, a question from Melvin Ellis, and it's, it's long. <laughs> I uh, would love to hear a response to this three-step action plan to help our impoverished fellow citizens to break the cycle. Number one, restore law and order so it's safe to go out on the street. Crime affects the poor, especially people of color, more than any other group. Two, school choice so parents stop sending their kids to failing schools. Competition can be wonderful. Three, enforce an immigration law. Somewhere between two to three million illegal immigrants have entered the country in the last 18 months, and they will compete for entry level jobs. The first rung on the ladder is critical to poor Americans who want to climb out of poverty. So um, uh, there, there's no question that bringing violence down, um, I, I would have to really think about how I would rank sort of the most urgent needs. These, these four that I offer in the book to me are, are um, all uh, categorically critical and reducing violence is absolutely up there. We have a lot of literature at this point showing how important it is to reduce violence include, you know, from measures that are also outside of the police. So I think police and police reform is an incredibly important conversation that's going on right now. But the chief of police in uh, the outgoing chief of police in Stockton would be the first to say if he was answering that question, that the police cannot solve gun violence alone in the city of Stockton. They cannot solve it alone. And that's the same in Josephine, where so much of the investment in drug rehabilitation, so much of the investment in youth, all these other programs have also collapsed. And then law enforcement is the only thing standing. And police don't want that role. They don't want to be the only social services agency of very concentrated poverty. We ask too much of them. It is not their job. And, um, and uh, some of the um, pressure, um, you know, it's the outcomes speak for themselves. So yes, law enforcement is a critical part of this puzzle, um, but an anti-violence agenda is broader than that. Um, I'm gonna set aside the schools thing for, you know, because in my research, I have to set it aside because school funding does have this entitlement 
at the state level. And so we have greater equalization of schools. So I'm gonna set aside the, um, the school choice issue. Um, and on immigration, I would just say that um, when you look at the, and here I wanna just ground my answer in the city of Lawrence, Lawrence has about 88,000 people um, registered, but it also has a sizable undocumented community that um, uh, lives in the city and has found um, uh, homes there. And even the Route 128 corridor, which is the um, you know, Silicon Valley of Massachusetts, um, relies heavily on that whole labor force, documented and undocumented workers. Um, so, uh, so, you know, and I mean, here we are sitting at the gateway to California ag. Um, there are giant engines of economic growth in this country and giant employers who are um, relying on these workforces. So, you know, I am a big fan of comprehensive immigration reform. We're doing a terrible job on immigration, um, but, um, but to me, the reality of our, our workforce um, is, uh, is different. And, you know, it's kind of amazing to see cities like Buffalo, which we haven't talked about, but so much of Buffalo's um, rebirth and part of its neighborhoods um, is coming from immigrant vitality and reinvestment. The sort of entrepreneurialism and, um, and uh, tight social networks of new immigrant communities actually can rescue really poor cities that are suffering from depopulation. And since I work in a world of where lots of the places I work on have lost 40 to 60% of their population, they look at refugee communities and immigrant communities as a source of recovery, as a source of revitalization, but also just people, taxpayers, right? We got to like fill these houses because if we're not filling these houses, we've got blight and um, this, you know, catastrophic fiscal problem of depopulation. We have this, a comment from an alum, but uh, let me just quote it here. I used to work in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and now live and work in Long Beach, California. I'm part of the People's Budget Coalition in a blue city in a blue state. And yet we have been unsuccessful in persuading elects to reimagine our city budget in ways that invest in BIPOC communities, education, health and human services, housing service, run house, immigrants, ideas on affecting change when existing political leaders claim to be, I think it's a lose. Do you have any thoughts um, on that? Yeah. Um, I. I, you know, I'd love to have a longer conversation offline too about with that um, with that person. Uh, that's an inter it's interesting. I'd be interested to hear the larger kind of reinvestment that you um, have advocated for. And I, I don't know. I would just let that um, uh, let that comment stand and just invite you and anybody else to really think about the kinds of. Um, narratives that float around in our larger society at our universities and our media and our popular culture about really poor neighborhoods. And I think it interferes with the political will to actually show up alongside them, alongside them as places that are incredibly rewarding and I would say personally inspiring to work with. These are not places that we need to be afraid of or kind of, um, you know, uh, stigmatize. Um, and unfortunately, we are in a period of time where state politics, I think, are infected by the larger problem that when very low income cities and counties make news, it is usually because something terrible has happened, whether it's Gun, a gun violence record that's gotten broken or a you know leader who's been marched out in handcuffs. They only raise into our public dialogue when those bad things happen. I think we have to find a way of really talking about the good work that's going on so that people have the political will to invest in it. Thank you, Michelle, for such a wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to everybody here for your support of Stanford. I love my students. I love my students and so much of what the Stanford Alumni Association does and you guys as alums do is make it possible for me to have these exceptional people. So thank you personally.